All right, we want to uh, turn in our Bibles to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1, our focus on the uh, Advent season is going to be the angelic visits to uh, God's people surrounding Christmas time. And so uh, we're going to be in Luke chapter 1 and a few other places talking about these angel visits. This is the first angel visit that we... Uh, come to the visit to Zechariah concerning um, (laughs) the coming of Jesus Christ. What does it take to get ready for something? Guys, especially, I'm talking to you and and, uh, others who fall into this category. When you have to get ready for something, what happens here? For instance... Suppose you're hosting a Thanksgiving dinner at your house. Guys, what do you got to do? Well, you got to pick up all your junk that's laying all over the house, right? And you got to clean up, and then you got to vacuum a little bit. And you, you, this stuff that's been sitting here for three months now has to go, you know, and you have to go through all this work of cleaning up. If you're hosting a graduation party at your house, one of those all day affairs, now what do you have to do? You go from vacuuming the carpeting, now you've got to cut all the grass, make sure it's super nice, and uh, make sure that the yard looks nice. You've got to take all the stuff in your shed, put it behind the curtain, you know, over there. We've been, we've been in those sheds, and it's a lot of work. And then let's just say you're going to jack it up one notch more, and you're going to host a wedding in your yard. Well, now we're not just talking mowing the grass, we're talking about a whole new landscaping of your entire yard plus new shingles and maybe new siding on the house you know just so you can host this it's like it's good enough for us hon can it be good enough for them but it isn't and so the bigger the event the more work of preparation that needs to happen well in this uh, passage today you're going to see the importance of preparation when we are thinking about receiving the Son of God, into the world and into our lives. In Luke chapter 1, uh, verses 5 through 7, we have the stage set for us. It says, In the days of Herod, king of Judah, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah, and he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. But they had no child because Elizabeth was barren and both were advanced in years. Now this motif, this scenario, this setting is common in the Bible, isn't it? I mean, right away we are thinking about what we are, have been talking about in Genesis. Abraham, Abraham and his wife, Sarah, are old. And they don't have a child, and it's very important to have a child, and, and it isn't happening. And so this is very familiar to us. We recognize this situation. They're, they're holy, they're righteous, they've loved God. It doesn't make sense that they wouldn't have a child, but they don't. Now in verses 8 and 9, we discover something about what it means to be a Levite and a priest. In that day, uh, verse 8 and 9, Now while he was serving as priest before God, when his division was on duty, according to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And so evidently all the Levites in the area of Jerusalem, all well, in, in the country of Israel, You are divvied up into divisions, just like the army, divisions and companies and so forth. And then they would say, okay, division three, you're on duty for the month of March or something like that. And so they would come to town and they would do all the important temple stuff that had to be done. But there were some jobs that were unique and special And everybody wanted to do those things, but not everybody could because it only took one person. So what did they do then? It says um, uh, that that Zechariah uh, had been chosen by Lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. So he got picked this year. Probably never got to do it before. Probably would never get to do it again. 
And so he <coughs> was picked to go in and burn incense in this special ceremony in the temple. Well, while this is going on in verse 10, the multitude is praying. It says, and the whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour of incense. And I, I, I just smile when I see that. I love that, that picture, the uh, lives of God's people <clears throat> governed by the rhythms of worship and work and so forth. And this was the hour of burning the incense and the hour when all of us gather together and we're praying to God and, and so forth. And this is the normal rhythm of worship for God's people. We, we are not people that do whatever we want whenever we want. We, we are people who flow in the rhythms of work and worship and praise and adoration and thanksgiving and, and so forth. And it all functions to give meaning and joy and blessing to our lives. Now, the appearance of the angel happens here at this point, uh, verse 12, and Zech oh, I'm sorry, verse 11, and there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense, and Zechariah was troubled when he saw him, and fear fell upon him. All right, so the angel appears and, uh, of course, Zechariah is freaked out. You ever wonder why people are always freaked out when they see an angel? <clears throat> well, if you can see the communion table here, you'll notice angels are giants. <laughs> They're way bigger than anybody else, so that's one reason. No, I'm just kidding about that. I don't know. Sandy, where did we ever get these tall, super big angels? I don't remember either, but they're great. They're big. You know, we get the idea. Whenever anybody in the Bible sees an angel, they freak out. They almost faint. They are terrified. And so uh, this is, Zechariah is having the natural and normal uh, reaction to an angel. I've always, I say, you know, people today, they, they tell me, well, they were in their bedroom or in their living room or whatever, and an angel appeared to them, and it was, so wonderful and so cool, and it was just such a comforting presence. And I say, really? I said, you are the first person I've ever talked to that's had that reaction. You know, I, I don't quite understand. Anybody in the Bible that sees an angel just about faints from terror. You know, So I'm not sure what they're seeing. Maybe it isn't an angel. Maybe it's something else. I don't know. But uh, it's very fascinating. The appearance of an angel signifies that something big is about to happen. Angels are never casual. Angels are never just dinging along. Did you know that? Whenever you read about an angel in the Bible, they're on a mission. There is something big happening. An angel never shows up and it's like, well, what are you doing here? And he said, I don't know, I'm just hanging out. I don't really have anything to do today, so I just thought I'd come and hang around with you. They never do that. That's not what angels do. And so the angel appearance signifies something big is about to happen. In our modern world, we have experienced what uh, is commonly referred to as a reveal party, right? Whenever anybody gets pregnant, they, they have a little party to um, announce if it's a boy or a girl. I, I'm old-fashioned. I, I never wanted to know what we were going to have, you know, if we're going to have a boy or a girl. I wanted that to be a surprise and kind of governed by the Lord, but everybody likes to know. And so we have these reveal parties, and some interesting things happen at reveal parties. If you will Google this, you can even do it on your phone right now, Google, <laughs> Google uh, general, or sorry, gender reveal parties gone wrong. Just Google that once and just see what you get. There are tons of stories that involve forest fires, plane crashes, injuries due to shrapnel, and all kinds of terrible things happen at these gender, gender reveal parties. And uh, by the way, I'm old-fashioned in this too, but uh, you know, we used to have the shower, right? The shower, baby shower. And the ladies would all go to that. And the guys didn't have to go to that, right? 
And now they're trying to change that. They're trying to change that and make the guys go to that too. But I am still kind of old-fashioned. I do not think guys should have to go to, to uh, baby showers or gender reveal parties, but that's just me. I'm old-fashioned, and I'm beyond the deal. So anyway, whatever. As we, we read this, we discover that Zechariah is in his own private gender reveal party. And uh, <laughs> this is interesting. Um, verse 13 says, The angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. So there it is. You're going to have a son. It's going to be a boy. Poosh! The, the blue incense is burning, you know, <laughs> and they're coming out the window of the temple, I suppose, and and all the people are going, it's a boy, you know, and, and so forth. No, the, the, uh, th- this is fascinating. Um, your prayer has been heard, the angel says. Now, I don't know about you, but Zechariah is old. When did he pray that they would have a baby? I mean, can you imagine Zechariah and Elizabeth at, at supper some night, and he's going to pray for the food. He said, dear Lord, help us to have a baby and all of a sudden, whack, you know, Elizabeth just gives him a crack in the back of the head and says, what in the world are you talking about? I, we, we don't need any baby at this point. It's beyond that. You know, was Zachariah really praying for a baby still at this particular time? Maybe this was a prayer that he prayed a long time ago, and uh, that's still hanging out there. You know, that's still hanging out there, and maybe God is, is going to answer that prayer. Your prayer has been heard. So evidently they've been praying for a child, but I'm not sure how recently that was. But he is told it's a boy. The angel goes on to say some very significant things about this boy that's going to be born to Zechariah and Elizabeth. Uh, the first thing is his name was, was going to be John. We've, we've found that. Um, I'm just going to read through the next verses here and then go back and Comment them on. So, Wendy, you can kind of just, when we hit them, you can click through and, and we'll uh, get them up there. Um, so, in verse 14, it says, and you, shall, and you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great before the Lord, and he must not drink wine or strong drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb, and he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. And so here we see that John the Baptist is going to do a lot of cool things it says, uh, Wendy, could you go back to the, the first the slide before that? Yeah, the ABC, and let me, I know I'm hard on you up there today. Sorry about that. So his name will be John, the angel says. The next one is that the people will, he'll bring joy. When, when people encounter this kid, oh, there's going to be great joy and happiness. So that's a prophecy. And then what does it say? He will, uh, go ahead and put it up there. He'll be great before the Lord. This is not going to be a minor guy. He's going to be very great. And the next lead, letter D, he will not drink strong drink. Now, pay attention to this one because this is interesting. Uh, He's not going to drink strong drink, but then on the next slide, the next one is he'll be filled with the Holy Spirit. You know, a couple of times the Bible connects drinking and the Holy Spirit together in the same verse, right? In the Bible. And it usually goes like this. Do not get drunk with wine, which is dissipation, but instead be filled with the Holy Spirit. And here we're told that John the Baptist is not going to get drunk with strong drink, but he's going to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And so the idea is, what are you under the influence of? Are you under the influence of alcohol, or are you under the influence of the Holy Spirit? And John the Baptist was definitely going to be a Spirit-filled guy that's going to go out and do the work of the Lord. And so think about that as you ponder 
uh, drinking, and, and uh, is that good or a good idea or a bad idea? But remember, what do you want to be under the influence of? So go ahead and flip through the rest of those. He's going to turn people back to the Lord. He, people are going away from God. He's going to turn them around and help them to get back. Uh, he's going to operate in the spirit of Elijah. Elijah was a powerful prophet. And finally, he will get people ready for the coming of the Lord. He's going to get people ready, a people prepared. And um, how is he going to do that? He's going to do that by turning the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers. Well, it doesn't say that part in there. But let me just comment on that for just a moment. When, it, when uh, the passage says he's going to come in the power of, of Elijah and he's going to turn people back to God by turning the hearts of the fathers to the children, you and I might look at that and say, oh, wow, that's cool. There's something about parents having a heart for their children that makes one receptive to the coming of God in their life. We, we could go there. I could preach a sermon about how important it is to have good relationships, and, and it is very important. Everything I've said is true so far. But if I only said that, we would be missing a very crucial piece of this puzzle. Because when it says he's going to come in the power of Elijah and he is going to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. If, if you are a good Jewish person who has the Bible memorized, you are going to have your radar antennas suddenly pop up. And you are going to go back to what God said through the prophet Malachi, the last prophet of the Old Testament era, the last prophet to speak to God's people before there was a 400-year period of prophetic silence from God. And you would remember Malachi chapter 4, in which God says, I'm going to send my messenger. It's the last thing he ever said to his people. I'm going to send my messenger to you, and he is going to come in the power of Elijah and he is going to turn the hearts of the parents to the children and the hearts of the children to the parents in that great and coming day. And so when the angel says that, what he's doing is he is taking John the Baptist and tying him tightly to Malachi and the prophecies of Malachi, hooking them together and saying, the last thing that God ever said to us, he's starting to do right now in this moment, in this era, with the birth of this little baby, John the Baptist. John the Baptist is who Malachi was talking about. And John the Baptist's role is to get his people ready for the coming of God. Get his people ready for the entrance of the Lord into this world. So this is very cool. I love this. This, this angel visit ties the Old Testament and the New Testament very intimately Together, This is what he is going to do. So, so John the Baptist, God is on the move. God is ready to begin. God, we're here we go again. God is going to go into the next phase, the next step of his plan of salvation for his people. Well, um, as we said, at these gender reveal parties, things can go off the rails in a hurry. And this one does too. Uh, in, look at verse 18. And Zechariah said to the angel, How shall I know this? For I am an old man and my wife is advanced in years. Now, to me, that's a legitimate question. I mean, I would ask that, wouldn't you? I mean, this is the natural and normal thing. It's like, well, how can this, this how are we going to do this? This can hardly be. I can't imagine it. Zechariah is old. I don't think it's a bad question myself. But in verse 19 and following, the angel just lays into Zechariah. I mean, come on. Is this fair? Notice what he says in verse 19. Uh, and the angel answered him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. 
Do you think it was, maybe he was having a bad day? Maybe people weren't listening to him. He said, look, this is who I am. He said, I stand in the presence of God, and I was sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. And behold, you will be silent and unable to speak until the day that these things take place because you did not believe my words. You know, and of course, at this point, Zechariah can't talk anymore. But if he could, he would have said, I believed you. I mean, I believed it. You know, don't, don't be so hard on me. But uh, boy, the, the angel accuses him of not having any faith and lays this sentence down on him. You're not going to be able to speak until this baby is born. So the, the moral of the story is, if an angel ever appears to you, first of all, make sure that you're good and afraid, and secondly, whatever he says, go with. Okay, whatever the angel says, I'm with it. Yep, okay, here we go. I, I believe, I believe. And so in the meantime, while all of this gender reveal stuff is going on, the angel's making his big speech, connecting Malachi to John the Baptist and so forth. Uh, the people are sitting out there praying in the crowd. And after a while, you know, you, you, you ever been in one of those meetings? It's like, I, I, I can pray for like five minutes tops, right? And now we're, we're at minute 15 in the prayer meeting. It's like, I, I prayed for all my relatives four times over at this point, and I, what, what else am I going to pray about? I think that's what these people were experiencing. It says uh, there in verse 21, And the people were waiting for Zechariah, and they were wondering at his delay in the temples. You know, so they, they weren't thinking about God anymore. They were thinking about how things were going, and it wasn't going very well. And when he came out, in verse 22, he was unable to speak to them, and they realized that he had seen a vision in the temple and he kept making signs to them and remained mute. And so, uh, finally, Zechariah comes out, but he can't speak, can't say anything. The people put two and two together and realize this guy has seen a vision. Now, would you come to that conclusion? Would people today come to that conclusion? If, if you were in a building all by yourself and you came out and you couldn't talk, would you just think, he must have seen a vision from God? We would not think that, but they thought that. They, they, they said this is the only explanation for what could have happened to Zechariah. In the meantime, uh, Zechariah was doing a crash course in sign language. You know, he's trying to figure this out, you know, and sign and explain what's, what's going on. And uh, it's just a, a weird little moment here. Finally, it says uh, the last line there, and when his time of service was ended, he, he went to his home. So later on, they go home, and Zechariah's sitting in the living room with Elizabeth. I wonder how that conversation went, right? You know, signing and baby, you know, all this sort of thing. Uh, I don't know. Uh, Boy Scout motto. What is the Boy Scout motto? Anybody? I'm, I'm not, I'm, I suppose they have a longer one, I'm sure. I always think it's be prepared, right? Be prepared. Be prepared. Be, be ready. Don't get caught unprepared. Why, why was God sending John the Baptist to Zechariah and Elizabeth at this time in this way? Zero in on verse 17, the end of verse 17. It says at the end of that verse, to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. To make ready for the Lord a people prepared. That's what John the Baptist came to do. He came to get people ready. The coming of the Son of God is a big event. And as we've already seen, the bigger the event, the more preparation is needed. Is it true that God may come to a person at some point in their life, but because they have not prepared their hearts, they miss it? Can that happen? Can God come to you and you miss it because your heart wasn't prepared 
We weren't ready for that. We weren't in a situation where we could receive him. You know, God can make anything happen, of course, but uh, I'm, I'm just trying to come to terms. I'm trying to understand the role of John the Baptist in the coming of the Son of God into the world and into people's lives. How does a person get ready for such a, a moment? How do we prepare? How do we let our, the, the people of John's day had to get ready because Jesus was coming. How do we do it in our day? Well, if we follow through with what happened here, I, I offer these four things. First of all, we allow ourselves to be turned back to the Lord, especially through the repentance of sins. Turning back to God through repentance. That's, if you want God to come to you, you come to church and you say, well, I didn't get anything out of church that day. Say, well, maybe your heart wasn't prepared. Maybe you weren't in a condition ready for God to come. And how, how do you do that? Well, you turn back to God. You, you realize, I haven't been seeking the Lord. I've been going off in different directions. So you want to turn back to God and you especially want to do that accompanied with repentance, that is, taking a good look at your life and saying, hey, things got to change. Things need to be different. I need to turn my heart to my children. I need to turn my heart to my parents. I, I need to turn away from sin. I need to seek God's face. Secondly, our expectations are heightened as we are reminded of God's promised coming. John the Baptist come and came and he said, the, the kingdom of God is near, so repent. And he alerted people to the fact that, hey, God is about to do something. And he re reoriented their thinking and their understanding towards that. And that we, we can do that too. We can just say, hey, you know what? God might come to me today in a significant way. God may do a work in my life somewhere along the line today, and I want to make sure I don't miss that. And so we, we just have our expectations heightened. We are saying, instead of saying, well, I'm just going to live this day, and it's going to be a day, we say, this could be a day when God is going to come to me in a big way. So I want to be ready. We're expecting it. We're anticipating it. We're longing for it. We're praying for it. The last words of the Bible in the Book of Revelations, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. We want the Lord to come into our lives, either in that great big giant way at the end of the age or in the personal ways that he comes to each and every one of us every day. Thirdly, we let our hearts be turned to our children. Uh, I don't know, that's there, right? It was in the passage. There is something about reconciling relationships. There is something about being in good connection with. And there is something, again, in, in Malachi where the quote comes from, it's two-way street. Children have to turn their hearts back to their parents as well. We need a healing of the family relationships. And in a, a week where we have had domestic abuse front and center in a great big giant way, we all can see the importance of that. And fourthly, we need to embrace anew God's wisdom for faithful living. That's one of the things he said just in, at the end of verse, middle of verse 17. Uh, it says, he's going to turn the disobedient to the wisdom of the just. Turn the disobedient to the wisdom of the just. There is wisdom in obeying God. If you want to do the smart thing, you do the thing that God says to do. That's wise. Any other way is foolish. And so we want to re-embrace God's wisdom for living. Say, well, America is, is the, the trends are going this way, but I'm going to turn my trend towards God, and I'm going to take his wisdom for living seriously in my life. Here, here's the, the point. Jesus comes to each and every one of us every day, really. 
There are special days of big things, but then there are regular days of just normal, the normal presence of Christ in your life, the normal presence of Jesus entering into your heart and into your mind and being with you. And he's, he's doing that every day. And beyond that, he is going to come back bodily from the clouds to bring an end to the age someday. That's the, the great big return of Jesus. May we be a people prepared so that we might receive him when he comes. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for sending John the Baptist, for keeping all of the promises that you made to those Old Testament prophets and those Old Testament saints and continuing the work through him on into Jesus Christ, our Savior. We want to receive you when you come to us. We want to have hearts that provide a welcome home for you and for your word, for the presence of your spirit. We want to be a people who can dwell in communion with you, in holiness and love. We want to be a people who see their families in good and wonderful relationship with each other. Lord, this is our heart. This is our longing. Please bless us. Help us to be prepared that we might receive you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.